Welcome to CMM Off The Page, a podcast brought to you by CMM Magazine, a brand of Care Choices Limited. Guest speakers will equip listeners with take-home advice to support best practice in the social care sector. The podcast is available to listen to on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and to watch on the CMM website. We hope you enjoy this latest episode. Person-Centred Software are sponsoring this podcast. Person-Centred Software is the UK's biggest provider of care management software. Used by over 5,000 care providers, person-centred software improve the lives of people living and working in social care. Their solutions are loved by carers because they are built for carers. Hello and welcome one and all to the latest episode of CMM Off The Page, a podcast brought to you by Care Management Matters magazine. Today, we will be discussing the topic of the next steps in digitising social care. Now, this is a topic that holds great potential for the sector and people drawing upon it. And today I'm joined by a wonderful co-host who will be guiding us through everything you need to know today. And that is Liz Jones, Policy Director at the National Care Forum. And I'm also joined by an expert panel of speakers, um, th- those being Beverly Footit, who is Digital Transformation Lead at the National Care Forum, and Hannah Groombridge, Head of Healthcare Engagement at Person Centred Software. It's lovely to have you all here today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for thank having you. us. <laughs> so let's get stuck into it. I'll hand over to Liz, who's going to introduce the first uh, part of the podcast today. So I'm the policy director at the National Care Forum. We're a membership organisation for not-for-profit providers of care and support. Uh, And I would say over the last four or five years, the topic of digital and data, actually, we'll talk about that a bit later, have been really hot topics for uh, for the sector. So let's start with um, a bit of the basics, the scene setting, the context, a bit of the digital journey that we've had uh, so far. And when When the government or the Department of Health and Social Care or the NHS, because they also say it, talk about digitising social care, what do they actually mean? So shall I go go to you first, Bev, um, to give us a bit of the scene setting and also why should anybody listen to you and me? Why, indeed, yeah. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, lovely to be here. So yeah, as Digital Transformation Lead at the NCF, I kind of lead on all things digital and data, uh, as Liz has said. Um, and really, um, my role is to look at how we support our members, um, and but also on the policy and research side, how do we influence policymakers around the digital and data um, scene um, to make sure that they really understand um, the reality for adult social care providers. Um, So we're trying to influence that agenda. Um, We try to talk about investment. Well, we don't try to, we do. We talk about investment um, and the investment is really required to support um, the transition for adult social care providers as well in terms of digitization. Um, So I think to set the scene in terms of what what is it all about? um, Where has it come from? It's kind of the digitization of social care. Um, You know, I think we're all very aware the pandemic had a significant impact um, on this agenda. And where we found ourselves was, um, you know, the pandemic started and suddenly um, the great and the good realised that while we our adult social care providers were supporting a huge amount of people within our communities, the data wasn't available. Um, and then it was really difficult. So people had fantastic care plans for the individuals that they were supporting, whether they were supporting people in their own homes, whether it was in a care setting like a care home, etc. But most of those records were on paper. So it's really hard to demonstrate um, back to um, kind of the health and social care system during that really difficult time, who was being supported. And then that was difficult to then prioritise resources, prioritise support. Um, And certainly the National Care Forum, um, Vic and Liz in particular, were working really hard to have those conversations um, kind of with, with, you know, national health and social care systems and regional health and social care systems to try to represent. So I think really that that kind of accelerated the digitization of social care. So what was recognized is we need to have access to this data. Really important things are happening in adult social care on a day to day basis, on an hourly basis for some people in terms of their care and support that they receive. Um, so really, um, I think that that sets the context. So we really needed to improve that. If we were to have another crisis again, like the pandemic, we needed to ensure 
that we understood who was receiving care and support in our communities and quite rightly that the resources were prioritised appropriately um, and care providers indeed were, were prioritised to, to, to get that data. So we saw the first investment um, into digitisation for social care, so the announcement from Department of Health and Social Care to look at digital social care records, to prioritise investment into digital social care records. Um, so that was a disc, that's the DISC programme. Um, digitalization in social care. So 150 million pounds was announced. That was going to be rolled out 50 million pounds a year. And we're just entering into the last year. Um, so if you're listening to this podcast and haven't got your digital social care record, you need to move fast. We've got the last pot of money for digital social care records, and we've only got until March 2025 um, to draw down that funding. And we'll come into a bit more detail around that funding now. Um, so, yeah, so that was the first investment we'd seen into digitalization for social care. Now, what a digital social care record system enables you to do is start your digital transformation journey. Suddenly, you can have your data on a digital platform. It becomes available across your organization. You have an overview of exactly what's happening in a timely manner. The records can be updated. Um, as you know, minute by minute, if required, with your interaction with each indiv individual person. So as a registered manager, that gives you a complete overview of your workforce and, and the people that you're supporting. As a care worker, um, it's much quicker for you to demonstrate your interactions and your support with a person. You're able to, in real time, um, you know, to um, record or um, capture how that person is today um, and issues around well-being so we're not just talking about tasks here that happen um, in terms of people's care and support we are really interested and we are really good at in adult social care is looking at the well-being of an individual and how our interaction with the person can improve those those outcomes in terms of well-being um, so that's the start so I think you know and Hannah I'm sure you'll come on to it um, in a moment so that's a huge benefit to have those records and to have that much broader understanding and capture that information about a person. So Hannah, the guru from PCS, <laughs> can we hear from you, please? So we provide a suite of integrated digital solutions that, um, as I said, are there to improve lives. Um, but they do that through sort of improving um, efficiency and effectiveness and compliance of care in care settings. Um, and they're currently we're supporting over 6,000 care providers. Um, I think you're you're absolutely right, Beverly, what you're saying around um, that the point of this is about gathering information about people and it's very much about person-centred information about people. So um, our solutions are all based around um, reducing the administration tasks that, that carers are having to, to you know, administer to and um, giving them time back to care. So it's not about, mm. you know, taking jobs away from people. It's more about actually getting you back doing what you intended to do in the first place. I don't think anybody goes into care thinking, do you know what, I'd really like to fill out all these assessments today and write all of these care notes at the end of my shift. And, you know, so it's about giving back. So, um, and it does that. So um, what we do find with the digital solutions is that that more information is being able to gather, but actually you're still saving time because you're doing it at the point of care. So we're seeing recordings of over nine and a half million care notes every single day from our 6,000 providers, which is incredible. So I think it worked out to be before using a DSCR on paper, you'd be recording sort of maybe between 10 and 20 notes about a person a day. And now you're seeing sort of 60 to 70 notes about a person per day, which is incredible. Um, and because it's being done in real time, so as you're doing these things, um, well, you know, as you're delivering care, you're actually getting much more accurate and person-centered information um, rather than having to, I mean, anybody's like me, I blink and I forget what happened 10 minutes ago. So I think it really enables you to get a much truer picture of, of what um, is happening for people, but also what is important to people. I'm just interested in, um... If you can tell us a little bit more about how the digital uh, social care record idea, how it can really help um, managers and uh, care teams to focus on the outcomes for people. Yeah, it, 
it's effectively it enables you to have all the information that you're gathering whether it you know because delivery of care but but also about a person but also about you know how you're performing within your organization and this isn't about you know having a stick to beat people with this is about enabling education and understanding of where things could be improved upon or actually what you're doing really really well and what's working and and so forth so um it enables you to pull that into one space you know traditionally if you wanted to have any idea of actually how you you know what the outcomes are you'd have to gather that from so many different areas you wouldn't just be able to do it from a click of a button and that's effectively what's happening is because it's all gathered into one space you can you can click of a button see what's happening and you can dissect that in any way you need and that's really important so on a person level it's really important to sort of see what's happening with that person and perhaps any changes that need to be made but also from an organisation and a wider population as well to to really sort of help then drive um, how change needs to happen uh, maybe on a policy level or you know on yeah. because that's ever evolving you know that's that's always changing you know it might be actually you know if you're looking at sort of more from a system perspective you know an ICS perspective around your your area that you're living within actually how do we need to um, change or or drive that social care um, engine to make sure that it's sort of delivering the right way. And a lot of that comes from information from those that are delivering care. So it's it's taking that information and being able to share it. So I think when we talk about data, it always sounds really impersonal. I always think it sounds like numbers and such, and it really isn't. It's, you know, it's really important information. And I think when we talk about integration, we also, it's really scary. It feels a bit like, you know, you're, sort of sharing for sharing sake and it's not like that it's it's very much about the important things the things that really help to understand how we are performing as a unified delivery and I'm talking you know across health and care at this point you know as a unified delivery you know how we how we are delivering what works well what perhaps doesn't how they can work better together and then as you said the outcomes of that how that's actually impacting on the people that we're caring for. We're a founding member of the um, what was Digital Social Care and is now uh, the Digital Care Hub. And as part of that, we were um, involved in a digital pathfinder project, which we called the Hubble Project. And very early on, uh, we learned something fascinating, which was from one of our members who'd got both digital social care records and electronic medication system. Uh, in the first days of COVID, first days of the pandemic, way before there was any such thing as testing, they were able to see very quickly from the intelligence from both of those systems that uh, some of the people they were looking after in their care settings were displaying a whole range of symptoms of being unwell, none of which correlated with the traditional COVID symptoms we were supposed to be looking out for. And they were able to respond really quickly because they thought, mm, this person is not well, we need to do something in terms of isolating them, supporting them, uh, keeping a close eye on them. And uh, it, when testing did come, it turned out that they were right to suspect that it was probably COVID because a lot of the things they were spotting in the older people they were supporting uh, were consistent with how older people presented with those symptoms. Uh, and then we we're able to feed that back into the kind of public health and knowledge system to mm -hmm. say, actually those things you're supposed to be looking for are not the right things so so yes bev really powerful uh, yeah i was just kind of come in in terms of that kind of that outcomes piece um liz and continue what you were saying hannah because i think the other opportunity for providers with the digital social care record system as well is around service improvement so you're trying to make changes you're trying to maybe change your service um model approach and you can track it you can track it across those yeah. outcomes liz so we come back to I've made this change here. What is the impact? What difference has that made to the 47 people I'm supporting? Um, so I think that's really powerful as well. Really powerful because before you'd kind of take a risk, wouldn't you? But it would be really hard to demonstrate and to demonstrate it at what is critical, that personal level. Has it made a difference to each individual that's accessing my services? So, yeah. And I think to add to that, I think there's a traditionally, um, when we make a change, it can take a quite a long time for us to see how that's yeah. impacted those outcomes. And maybe you're not able, you know, I mean, certainly 
in projects I've worked with previously, you don't, you're not always able to, there's quite assumptions that can be made as well, because you're not really able to maybe ever, you Absolutely. kind of think this is happening, but you're not sure. Yeah. If you know, it, whereas I think it gives us evidence. So certainly for, um, yeah, making those changes and then, you know, uh, implementing them or, you know, tweaking them even to sort of make them more suitable. I think all of that becomes much faster as well. Um, you know, the, the health, care system is very slow in the way that it moves it is a bit of a tanker you know and social care can also be the same it can you know when it comes to change I know we saw this huge shift over Covid but certainly I think yeah you know it's quite a slow wheel to turn so I would like to see and I do think it will we'll see improvements in that as well that those changes will be made a lot faster um, but but also it'll be more um, evidenced so it'll be about things that are really working as opposed to, well, that didn't work. So we'll try this solution instead and see if that works. And, you know, it actually be more evidence So, yeah. So from a person level, right the way up to that, that system level, I think it would make a huge difference. So I want to bring you back to the point you made, Hannah, about it can be scary. And there are some good reasons to be scared, aren't there? Because Absolutely. with the catalyzing from uh, effective, from COVID of accelerating the adoption and use of technology by loads of people, not just us, um, we have got an increased risk around cybersecurity, data protection, all that kind of thing. So let's just have a bit of a chat about what we do to make sure we're aware of those risks, particularly around cybersecurity, and what we might do to alleviate those or at least mitigate as far as we can I think not not everything can be foolproof but we can get we can get there can't we well first of all um, you know we, we've got a fantastic program at the moment that again is in, um, we suspect is in its last year of funding which is the better security better care program um, so there is a tool um, that's been developed specifically for adult social care after some pushback um, in terms of making it bespoke um, and that's a DSPT, so the Data Security Protection Toolkit. So I think that's the first stage um, for adult social care providers, definitely, that we would recommend. You, It's a self-assessment tool. Um, I think some people are scared that it's not a self-assessment tool, um, that actually they're being judged. You're not. It's, it's a tool. It's a self-assessment tool. It's a business tool. It's for you to look at internally. Um, and basically, with the um, Better Security, Better Care program, fantastic opportunity. There's loads of resources to help you support to complete the data security protection toolkit and make the changes within your organization to make your data whether it's digital or whether it's still paper and some is still on paper let's let's face it we haven't completely um eroded paper from 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 our organizations but it just means you're it, it's much safer so definitely i would recommend if you haven't completed the dspt that you need to be looking at that and check out the better security better care program alongside the resources that's available um and it's all via the digital care hub website the better security better care program we have local support organizations so within your area, there will be a local support organisation that will actually really come and help you if you're struggling for that DSPT. So that is what I would recommend. That's the starting point. Um, we know that not adult or you know some larger um, adult social care providers, they might have an IT team, they might have a cybersecurity guru. That's not the case if, if, if you're a much smaller organization um so it's about you know how, how do you get that knowledge um and certainly that's something that we've been looking at from the ncf point of view is, is how can we bring in that expertise because it's a whole new area and you know it's very niche you know i'm interested in cyber i'm not a cybersecurity expert i'm not you know a cybersecurity tech person um, i just know it's really important and what we are seeing is um, not to scare people that are listening, but we are seeing a huge increase in cyber attacks. Adult social care data is really, really valuable. Think about the data we're collecting, not just around the people that we're supporting, but your workforce. The people you're supporting, we've got dates of birth, we've got their names, we've got their addresses, we've got bank accounts. We hold all of that for, for staff as well. So um, unfortunately, that makes us very attractive <laughs> in terms of being targeted. So we really need to understand that. And part of that is um, we know lots of the breaches, they're human errors, they're human errors. So how do we um, upskill our staff to understand the dangers around cybersecurity or the risks, not the dangers, the risks around cybersecurity and how we reduce that as much as we can um, and how we can recognize like a phishing email um, and know not to open it. 
and they're getting really clever. They're really sneaky. There's some horrible people out there that are kind of doing the attacks. They're getting really clever, really sneaky. So, you know, the, the, there's a skills piece as well. Um, and again, the NCF, we're really keen to, to support our members to say, right, how, how can we do that? How can we help you understand cyber within um, your own organisation? So let's talk a bit now about the art of the possible. So you said, Hannah, about seeing kind of digital social care records as the sort of foundation, the kind of initial step that might start catalyzing uh, integration with other technologies, the benefits of linking with those different technologies uh, and what what might be possible on that digital journey to support social care providers accessing tech and systems that could really be of a benefit to them and their staff and most importantly the the people they support so let's talk a bit about what we mean when we say the art of the possible with technology let's bring this it to is life my favorite subject excellent i love this and and actually it's happening already it's it's it is already being done so there are different levels i think we can look at this from so one is purely around sort of how your different softwares talk to each other, how they integrate. I'll help back the assured suppliers. That's another really important point. There is integration standards that we have to meet. And that is very much based around the ability for softwares to talk to each other, but also for softwares in social care to be able to communicate with software in, in the NHS, so that vice versa, so we can start getting the information. So one really good example of this is GP Connect and it's there already. So GP Connect is um, a national program that enables care providers to view um, the GP records of the people they care for. So um, there are levels of security that are layered into this, but it's actually a really easy process to um, get involved with it. So first of all, you need to check with your um, digital social care record provider as to whether they you can access it directly. There are other ways of accessing it as well through through portals and such locally, but that's normally a first port call. So this is a great example because um, being able to, at the, and it literally is the click of a button, view somebody's GP records, and that is purely because of an integration between two different systems, enables you to save, I wouldn't even like to guess how many hours on the phone or emailing your GP surgery to try and find out, you know, if um, what happened with the last visit or if a medication's changed or if there's a new allergy or a new resident or you know somebody new in your service so that is really powerful then you go on to other sorts of systems that work together so it might be we mentioned about medication so medication management so the digital version of that is email um, and I'm going to talk from a person-centered software perspective on this as well so we hugely value we always have valued the choice that a care provider should have as to what solutions they use within their service because i mean we try and go obviously from our perspective of what is the best of the best but it actually really depends on so many different things you have to, be able to choose what fits your service um, at that particular time so if you were to adopt a, an email solution you could potentially be working across two different platforms which actually might still save you time in the short term compared to on paper, sure. And it would certainly reduce risks and errors. But if you could get those two systems to talk to each other, you not only save time because you are working on you know, one device on one app and one piece of software, but you're actually joining up the information so you can then create a much better story about somebody. So we were talking before about the prevention piece about how you can see it's about seeing changes in people so you're not just seeing changes but you're seeing what's influencing those changes so it could be a new medication that somebody's on and you can almost well you can put it to a timeline to see oh well actually they were given this medication and you know they started experiencing these symptoms or you know actually these improvements so you can really tie things together and I think that's really really powerful then you start taking it into a whole other level of um, so that preventative care and falls is a really good example of this. So there's a lot of falls technology. So um, with falls technology, you have the 
the detection piece that enables you to know somebody has fallen. Um, so even enabling that alert to actually come onto your handset and then leave a care note within your care record. I mean, that is brilliant. I mean, how do you, you just can't replicate that in any other way because it's all real time. Um, and it means you don't have to, you know, so if there was a fall and there was an alert, a care note is then raised to say, this person has fallen at this time. You could even go as far as then to link it to show how quickly somebody attended that person. It means that you can then say to the ambulance, if you're the GP or the or 111, if you're um, reporting that person's had a fall, to actually know how long they've been on the floor. So you're, as we all know, with unwitnessed falls, the difficulty is knowing how long somebody's been on the floor. And that vastly changes the outcome of what happens to that response. So whether you have an ambulance or you don't, effectively. So you can answer those questions. You can also then to, you know, make that improvement to your service if you need to look at the response times or how you're responding or the process of that. Um, and all of these things are evidenced within your DSCR, which is why I believe your DSCR is your foundation. If you can get that bit right and that it can integrate with other solutions, you know, they sh it should almost be boundaryless and it's driven by the care provider as to how they integrate or that they integrate, enables you to build this whole ecosystem around a person as to what they need and be able to evidence everything as well that helps you to improve the care to somebody and the rest of the people that you care for um, and it also helps with your compliance as well because you can really evidence what you are and you're not and not doing so you know if you're talking about sort of cqc auditing actually you know it gives you a lot more of a foundation to be able to show them what is really happening without sort of any black holes which is great bev you've been doing a bit of um, exploring of the world of sensor technology oh, and wow. also thinking about how uh, well a whether there's any money to support things beyond uh, digital social care record systems and if there isn't how might we find some but also thinking about um, actually the uh, the vast amount of information that can be available from sensor technology and what the kind of future vision of that might be. So shall we yeah. talk a bit about some examples of that sort of sensor tech yeah, and then no. what the what the art of the possible might be yeah. in, in the future? Absolutely. And I think it's fair to say for the UK, <laughs> we're quite late to the market in terms of kind of ambient sensing. So we know in Scandinavia, yeah. it's a bit it's old it's old hat old hat really um so they've been working with it you know 10 15 years in some places so um i think a lot of people's first experiences uh, it has been around acoustic monitoring so you know a few years ago you would have had your falls map that's your falls prevention that's that's what we would understand so um ambient sensing or i can't remember the phrase you just used <laughs> this um sensor like um, acoustic technology monitoring. Yeah, so we've got the acoustic monitoring, but it's it's there's a lot available. Um, and, and one of the things that um, I'm really keen to do is we need to capture the, the learning on a global basis. So the art of the possible, a, a lot of it's already happening. It's just not happening on our on our little island. So it's about how do we reach out? So, yeah, so the acoustic monitoring, um, so ambient sensing generally. Um, and, and actually, I was talking to a provider yesterday. So we've already got systems that are available and they are available in the UK. Um, they're moving to laser technology as well. Um, so you don't see it. You don't see these lasers. So there's a little plug in in the corner of your room um, and it can monitor your heart rate. It can monitor your breathing rate. Um, the acoustic monitoring that um, traditionally what that's looking at is, you know, have you sat up in bed? Are you getting out of bed? And indeed, can you know, has somebody fallen? So, so it's looking, it's it's looking at that. But this ambient sensing, as we know it, is really moving on a really fast pace. It comes with a capital cost, and it comes with an ongoing revenue cost. That's the big problem. Um, and again, that's why we are campaigning hard. Um, we need to be heard, really, because the benefits here, um, you know, they shouldn't just be you know, they're for our whole community. Um, they impact in terms of massive savings in terms of healthcare. If we can get this right, this this prevention, and I would say I use the word prediction as well, because part of that prevention is prediction, isn't it? So we're predicting and and we and we can stop it. So if we've got all this this sense of technology, if it can come into um, care settings, and, and this includes people in their own homes. Yeah. So this sense of technology is plug and go. If your mum's at home living on her own, we can do it there. 
Um, there's also sensor technology at the moment that will map over time your gait. So how are you walking? Is your gait changing? It can predict that you're getting frailer or you might be at risk of a fall. It will predict that on a timeline. So yes, so the interventions are, can we get you strength and balance classes? Can we, you know, can we intervene? Um, so it's almost magical, some of the sensing stuff that's out there, but it's a reality. So yeah, so what we've got to sort out is how is it funded? And like I say, so what would be really great is for commissioners to see that overall piece in terms of, and I think that's partly what we've got with technology generally, not just the, the sensor technology, is often it's just falling to the care provider. You're purchasing digital service, your care system, you're purchasing the add-ons, you purchase the sensor detection. But actually, what about ICSs? Where's their, their responsibility in terms of better health outcomes for their whole communities? Um, adult social care, you know, we've got quite traditional roles, roles of um, modes of models of commissioning adult social care. We need to be thinking much broader and say, how do we collectively invest in this type of technology? I might have got this wrong, but I thought with the digitizing social care money, it wasn't just focused on digital social care record systems. There was also supposed to be some money for other types of technology. Have I misunderstood that? Right. So it, they included acoustic monitoring. They're quite specific about false prevention and acoustic monitoring. It's really interesting because we, we're trying to get data back from the Department of Health on Social Care to see if they're able to share with us. That, I talked about the £150 million a while ago. So that was £50 million each year. Um, so yes, you're exactly, you're right. And actually, Liz, on that note, because what has happened with that funding is if you were an early adopter of a digital social care record system, you weren't able to get any retrospective contribution funds towards it. So, so what we were hoping for is that's great, you're an early adopter of digital social care record system, is it appropriate for your service to go down the false prevention acoustic monitoring? Um, However, we, we, we did hear, and this is just a rumble, we heard a bit of a rumble that was saying um, ICSs, the money's um, being put out through ICSs um, in some areas, it's actually the local authority that's administering the grant. Um, they stopped encouraging applications around falls monitoring and uh, the acoustic monitoring. Um, oh, so we, okay. so um, we think they're prioritising digital social care records systems at the moment. And if that's the case, that's, that's a huge shame. Because like I say, you know, providers are at different points in their digital journey. Actually, there are some basics that we haven't covered here. So there's 150 million quid. It's 50 million quid a year. How, where do you go to get it? Who mm -hmm. gives it to you? And how much will What will get? it pay for? And is it enough? So actually, yeah, let's look. Can we just pick... so, shall we unpick that? Yeah. yeah, there isn't right. a so, simple uh, answer to that. Where, where, right. where so, do you go to get it? So, so the cash was um, being given to ICSs. However, some ICSs, some ICSs. So we've got forty-two ICSs. Some yeah. ICSs decided to give it to the local authority. Um, um, NCF, we do have a lovely map actually around. Um, ICSs, do. so yes, don't we, Liz? So we come on, we come on to our it. website, have a look at our ICS map, and then it will give you the local authority. Um, and digitizing social care will give you your link to your disc lead, so you will get an email. We have had some issues that then that person doesn't respond because they've moved on, but we we chase that up with them. <laughs> so that happens. So that's your starting yes. point. Is um, yeah, <laughs> you need to find out whether it's your ICS or your local authority. Generally, you don't get a phone number. I'm so old. I really like a phone call, but we don't get to phone people. We have to email people. But anyway, that's just me because that's my age because I like a phone call. But um, yes, yeah, so you will get you will be able to email them. So um, but then, yes, as Hannah's touched on, each ICS or local authority then have set their own policy. March and the target, which has now moved to March 25. Yes. Yes. So is it 80% 80 of all registered care providers or is it 80% of the people supported? It's both, yes. Liz. So, yeah, there you go. So 80% of all um, yeah, registered care providers will be using digital social care records and 80% of people accessing registered care services will have a digital social care record. So they've got two numbers that they're looking at. The funding itself, how it, who receives it, sorry, not who receives it, how much you receive, 
is in year one, we had some ICSs that were delivering funding for two for two years, you know, 100% for two years, and others that were sort of 100% for one year. Um, now, it is pretty much across the board, 50% of year one costs, and that is for your software licensing, so your, your revenue cost, your any hardware, because you do need devices to be able to do that. You might even need a laptop because some don't even have a laptop yet to be able to access, you know, um, records that way. Um, and your implementation and training costs. So that's 50%. So you have to match fund it. You have to provide 50% of that. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, it's still, that's good. It's better than nothing. But I definitely mm. agree with you, Beverly, on the fact that you need to make sure that you are aware that this is an ongoing cost. This isn't something that's going to stop in 12 months time. Um, so you have to factor in the costs and, that. and and how you do that really depends on the provider. You know, some cross charge it back, some don't, you know, it all just really depends, but you certainly need to understand that it is an, a longer term costing. Um, so yeah, and I, I, but we need more of it. We need, you know, and I also, you're talking about, we're talking about falls prevention and detection and the the money for that but actually i think there are other areas that we really need to be identifying now that we should be digitizing and medication management is the top of the list Absolutely. you know the, the yeah. risk associated with meds delivery is incredible and the burden the financial burden on the nhs from you know incorrect or, or i say badly managed i don't mean that from a sense of anybody's doing anything wrong but as in it's a it's such a um uh you know a, a risky process you know with with lots of sort of um variances to that medicate digitized medication management can change all of that and it can reduce your errors down to zero we've seen that in a number of cases so you know i certainly think that we as a, a nation should be looking at, okay, we've got our platforms for recording care. Let's now look at where we can really make a huge impact. And that's going to be, you know, digitizing medication management. So we there is some money and and there is a way to find the person who's got the money. And uh, they'll have an allocation system locally for how you get the money. And there are a range of providers on this, um, the assured providers list, uh, that the Department of Health and Social Care have. They have a list for assured suppliers of digital social care records right. that meet yeah. all the standards that Hannah's just outlined. So we know who we could ask for a quote to give us a system. We know that we found somebody who will tell us how much money we might have and we'll, we'll know what the gap is. So if you're, in terms of the money, if you're a provider who has not yet started any of this and is listening to all of this thinking, blimey, that's all sounding quite hard. Mm. Um, are there any, what, 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 what should we say to them? You know, do they, what happens if they stay on paper? Um, do we think there'll be something jazzier and more innovative than digital social care records coming? How do they make sure that the person, the supplier, the assured supplier that they choose, how do we make sure that they're actually getting the relationship um, as well as the product that they need. So what mm. what we what we're gonna tell those those people listening to us thinking sounds a bit hard. Yeah, can I add a layer of complication to that? Yeah. Sorry. You said that you're they can look to the assured suppliers list where they're all compliant, and that's not the case. So the yeah, okay, is say, still ongoing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's really important to just make that really clear that everyone like this is on a journey and there are some that are far further ahead than others and some that are not. So I would certainly utilise that assured list for what it's really intended for, and that is understanding who is assured and who is on their way to assurance. So we said before about asking about um, uh, digital security, but actually across yeah. all the standards, I think it's worth asking what the plan is for that. So there are quite a few on there that are far behind on those standardizations we had a deadline that was originally january got moved to march march has now been and gone it's extended slightly but that's mainly because there are quite a few that are doing really well with their assurances and actually they've only got a few to finish but certainly i'd, I'd say just be careful that it's not everybody on that list is assured to all of the standards yet okay and just to correct my point earlier 
the assured supplier list is on the digitizing social care website yeah. and it's been those um, solutions those suppliers have been assured by NHS England yeah so they've gone through a technical process and they're either fully compliant or a bit compliant by the sounds of it Hannah they're either That's... done it or on the way to doing it yeah. and you might want to check carefully what they've done and what they're on the way to doing okay got, got it so yeah. Bev what we what we're telling people who are listening thinking blimey so I mean first of all Lise you said is there something more exciting that's going to come <laughs> and overtake it that would be great I haven't got a hint of that Anna I don't know if you've got a hint of that so I think it is what we've got um, I mean certainly we know like PCS in particular we can see what a massive journey you've been on as an organization in terms of where you started as yeah. a social care record provider and now you've got this whole suite of add-ons which is super exciting to see so digital social care records hasn't stood still um what happens if you decide well they're only going for 80 percent, so I'll just sit quietly in that 20 percent so we do know it's um you know CQC have stated publicly a couple of times don't expect to get outstanding or good if you haven't got digital social care record systems so we've got that coming we haven't gone on to it yet Liz but we do know there's an intention that you've got to meet a, a minimum data reporting standard yeah, that's, true. Yeah. that's coming you can't meet that if you haven't got digital social care records so I think and this is just Beverly Footit saying this that's fairly soon into the future um, if you decide to sit quietly and be that 20 percent I'm not sure you'll be, continue to be a registered care provider in the future that is just me saying that because I don't know how you're going to meet the requirements that are going to come that will become mandatory and will become part of registration you just you just won't be able to do it I absolutely understand um, from providers um, and, and sometimes it's the smaller providers, but not always. We've got a fantastic system. We've got our own bespoke system and it works. You know, um, it's not a digital social care record system. They might have made their own on an Excel spreadsheet. Why would we change that? Um, and what I would say is we, we've heard today from from Hannah and, um, you know, actually it brings you much more benefits once you do get the digital social care record. In terms of practical advice, talk to other providers. There will be somebody in your area that is quite similar to you. Now, most providers that I talk to, I would say most were worried about this. I mean, some were super excited and, you know, <laughs> ahead of the curve in terms of digital. The majority are going, what? You know, I'm running, I'm, I'm running a care service here. My knowledge, my skill set is about people. What, what, what is this kind of whole digital agenda? So find, if you haven't already got a network with local providers in your area, there will be a local trade association. Find out who your local social care trade association is, or you might be part of a national member, so you might be part of the National Care Forum. Come to us. If you completely don't know where to start, reach out and, and connect with other people. But if you can find other providers in your area and go and see the systems that they've chosen, that is my biggest recommendation. You need to see it in action. So, um, you know, because with all due respect, Hannah, a suppliers, you know, are, are going to tell you, yes, our, our solution is the best for you. It's going to be fantastic. You need to see if it suits you. Everybody's different. So go and see a couple of providers that got a couple of the solutions. Maybe you've narrowed it down by looking at the short suppliers list. Maybe you've, I mean, you know, you all are offered demonstrations. So you may have had the number of demonstrations and then you're still a bit lost. Find providers in your area who are running those systems and physically, like the good old days, go out and see people and say, right, can I actually look at it? And I think that often is the transformation bit list. So I've again heard back from providers that are going, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And actually, I've spoken to this other registered manager. They were where I was and they've done it and, they, and they're saying they wouldn't look back. They're saying I wouldn't change it. And actually, we've got all these additional benefits that we didn't anticipate. So get the support of your colleagues, basically. That's, that's what we're saying. And my other piece of advice sort of add to that would be to involve all of those that are going to be using it. So don't Absolutely. just, you know, just don't leave that down to the you know managers or the owners or... You know, I would involve the carers, um, you know, care, assist uh, care assistants. I would involve, 
you know, even down to, um, you know, your, your your kitchen teams to a degree, because actually there's elements there that can support them in the, you know, in, in nutrition delivery. So <laughs> I would I would get yourself like a working group together almost of, you know, a, a, of different people within your organisation that that can cut, bring a different view to this, because I think that's really important. And we quite often see, um, you know, you have one person within that organisation that's really driving it. If you involve more people in that decision, they don't feel like it's sort of a burden upon them. It is something that they've been involved with. There is a voice and there'll be compromises. There always is with everything that you do. But certainly I think you'll have buy-in from, from more of your stakeholders, which actually makes the implementation of it so much easier. Okay. Um, so I would I would definitely do that. Get more people involved in that um, for sure. So the message is be bold, be brave, be confident. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how do we, brave. from a supplier perspective, Hannah, what, what advice should we be giving to our audience about being demanding and managing that relationship? What can they really expect from that relationship, particularly thinking about some of the things you've talked about, about future proofing as well as current compliance? What should they be demanding of you? Nicely, um, obviously. Quite a lot, actually, really. They definitely should be demanding from us. So one of the things that they should definitely be demanding is um, that they have a good structure of support. That is so vital. Um, so having a, you know, whether it be like an, a key account manager or a good, you know, good network of support, both technically, but also sort of around how you're utilising that system, because what always happens is you you get it you get the system implemented you upload start uploading care no, um uh, sorry care plans you start logging your care notes but there is far more that you can do with your solution so the the support that you get from your software provider is key to that they should be checking in with you regularly or at least you should be able to check in with them and identify areas that you can improve upon that you can use the system more effectively and that only happens over time there is no fast tracking that you just have to be using it to identify you know what what works what doesn't work what you want from it and the next thing would be is you need to have a way of feeding back your requirements so if there is development needs you need to be telling us your, your software suppliers exactly what it is that you want from that solution now i can't say that everything you want will always be done but certainly what we do personally is we have a way of logging that so you can log it through our system that actually you would like to see this development happen and we sort of categorize it almost so if we have loads of care providers asking for the same thing it bumps up the list of our priorities when it comes to development if we have somebody that puts in everything and everything gets read if they have a really great idea that we hadn't considered before you know we might look into that and explore it as to actually is this something that care providers just don't yet know that they need so we might actually implement that so a lot of our development comes from our customers from the care providers that are using the system so absolutely be asking how do i provide my feedback how do i get my voice heard within the organization and um, they would definitely be my sort of key areas and then i would be wanting to know what's what's the future looking like so GP Connect is really key. And again, on that short suppliers list, not everybody has access to GP Connect within that um, software. So certainly asking, when are you going to deliver it? When can I expect to be able to access that? I think that's really, really important. And one subject we haven't spoken about is shared care records. So there is, um, although it's not sort of in full swing as a national program at the moment, certainly on an ICS level, so you know, on a local level, Every ICS should have a, an, a shared care record program in place. So a shared care record is a unified care record that can be accessed for a person from lots of different areas across health and care. So it might be within mental health, it might be within adult social care, it might be within you know the hospital or ambulance service, but they all then have access to the same information about a person. So hospital packs are a really great example of this, that where you would, if somebody was being admitted to hospital, you would gather all that information about a person. You can actually do that digitally. So you don't have to do that anymore. You just have to put in some simple information around why they're being admitted and it can be shared. So shared care records are, are really the future. And then and then now that real joined up care approach. 
Um, so I would certainly be asking from your supplier, what are your plans for shared care records, you know, for integrating with them? And from your um, digital teams within your ICS is what is their roadmap for that? So some have got shared care records in place that um, sort of NHS teams can access. Social care comes sort of a bit further down the line. Others have included social care very early on. Others are now moving into the social aspect. So understanding where they are with it, because if it's available, you want to be able to access it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to access it, you need to find the easiest route to that. It might be in the short term that you have to use it through a separate portal. And the longer term is that you have direct in context access from your DSCR. But you need to kind of understand where the roadmap is for that on both sides. So that would be really important. And actually, your point about the shared care record, Hannah, has just reminded me. I'm going to make a couple of points about um, some of the terminology that's coming out of the Department of Health and Social Care about the bigger kind of broader data agenda. So the um, the department and, and the and NHS England have been working on a thing which is called MODS, a minimal minimum minimal operational data standard. Mm -hmm. And that is um, that's defining the data fields that need to be consistent across digital social care records. Um, and that's taken quite a long time to get to. Uh, so if you hear the word MODS described, it's about the standards relating to the data fields so that when um, you know, it's recorded that Liz is, has got celiac disease in one system, it will be the same, or Liz's favourite colour is purple, it will be the same, or whatever. Um, but then there is also the development of the um, provider, care provider, uh, minimum reporting data set, which is building on what the capacity tracker currently collects um, and will ultimately in an ideal world, be a flow of data from digital social care records when everybody has agreed what fields of data go into that um, reporting minimum data set. And so there's a lot of work going on that we're involved in uh, with both the Department of Health and Social Care and NHS England and other colleagues and the LGA, Local Government Association, uh, so lots of people have got an interest in the, sh the um, content of what a care provider minimum reporting data set would look like because everybody's quite interested in social care data now. Mm -hmm. So you may hear the, that terminology more and more frequently and the um, Health and Care Act a couple of years ago gives the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care powers to require data from care mm -hmm. providers. So there is no option once it's mm -hmm. all been finalized and piloted and shaped. So the future of data sharing, and data flows will be with us very soon, I think. Right, okay. So I feel we've gone on quite a journey talking about the digital journey. Yeah, mm, I yeah. think so. I feel we've covered a lot about what the basics of the digitizing social care uh, program is. We've talked about the money, we've talked about the nuts and bolts of how you get it, where you find it, who's got it. We know it probably won't cover everything, but it's a contribution. Uh, we've talked about um, being bold, being brave. brave. We've talked about being demanding of your supplier. We've talked about mm -hmm. upskilling your teams, making sure you kind of take a whole organization approach to it. Very good top tips from Hannah there. I'm going to go back to Henry. Anything else you wanted us to talk about, Henry? Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for your extremely insightful contributions today. It's been really, really fascinating to listen to uh, leaders in this area, uh, and I'm sure our listeners would agree. Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for today, but I'm sure everyone uh, could talk about this for the rest of the day. I'm sure it's been it's been really br uh, brilliant to uh, hear everything uh, that's been discussed this afternoon. So thank you so much for your time on behalf of CMM Off The Page. Uh, this episode has been discussing the next steps in digitising social care, and we can't wait to join you next time. 
Take care, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to CMM Off The Page. Explore CMM's portfolio of content, including daily news, blogs, a magazine, and CMM Insight webinars by visiting www.caremanagementmatters.co.uk. To make sure you don't miss a podcast, follow CMM on Twitter at CMM underscore magazine and use the hashtag CMM off the page to join the conversation and share your feedback. See you next time. CMM off the page. Listen, learn, lead.